Good morning, family. My name is Brian. I'll be reading the scripture passage for us today, which is from John chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 60. You can find that on page 839 in the Pew Bible, or you can also follow along on the screen. So John chapter 6, verse 60, the words of eternal life. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is God's word. This morning is our last sermon in the Gospel of John until after Easter. During the season of Lent, which begins on Wednesday and goes through Easter, we're going to be preaching through the Old Testament book, wisdom book of Ecclesiastes. I encourage you, I really encourage you to take time this week and in the coming weeks to, to read through the book. Listen to the book however you prefer. It maybe takes 30 minutes. But, but that one thing will make all the difference, I think, as we enjoy and learn from the book together. This morning's sermon from John, as David said at the beginning, will be short. The last 20 minutes of our service, we're doing what we've never done before. We're talking about the church plant and specifically fundraising related to that. If that seems weird to you, if that seems out of place, please know a few things. First, it seems weird to me. Uh, nine years, we've never done this, so there's no fear that this is going to become a regular part of our church service. Um, but planning a church is an unusual and wonderful event, and so we want to make space for it. And many of you, on top of all of that, have been asking for months how you can be a part. And so this will be a day to talk more about that. So let me pray, and I'll do my best to preach this in 20 minutes or so. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we all sang moments ago, we need you every hour. Lord, may that not be a cliche for us. May we feel that. Our need of you, particularly in the context of, of when your words get hard and the culture around us gets hard. But may we also feel your presence. Your preserving power. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. As I hear this passage read, and as Brian read it just a moment ago, I, I, I picture, I don't know what you picture, but I picture one of those classic locker room scenes from some great sport movie, right? Um, Hoosiers, Remember the Titans, Cool Runnings. <laughs> one of those is not like the others, but you have your own favorites. Um, and there's always that scene, right? That scene, there's, there's a change of coaches, there's the administration changes over, and the team has some early success, but then they hit adversity. The coach asks more of his players, and at some point he'll say, if you don't want to play, you can leave. There's the door. 
right? In our passage, it's a crowd, not a team. It's Jesus, not a coach. But it did seem like they loved their new Jesus. He healed their sick. They ate his food and even followed him across the Sea of Galilee to hear him speak more. That took effort. Now they're not so sure what happened. Noah preached a huge passage last week, and so let me go back into some of that passage by way of reminder. Statements at the end of last week's passage troubled the crowd of disciples. If you have a Bible, just just leave it open. It's going to be really helpful to see this there in print. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus said. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is, what does it say? My flesh. That's strange, right? They thought so. Look how they respond in verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How will Jesus respond to their response? Maybe he'll clarify in a way that's less offensive. Maybe he'll walk his words back. Maybe he won't. Verse 53 through 56. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And he goes on for a few more lines. Notice the last verse in what was we'll call Noah's passage last week, verse 59. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. It's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, perhaps that last line stands out more to me than it does to you. His words are troubling enough, even offensive. Then consider, he's a guest preacher. (laughs) Just, Just let that sit in. I sometimes coordinate guest preachers here at our church, and I sometimes end up as a guest preacher at other churches. In fact, in a Sunday coming up in May, because of a friendship there at West Shore Evangelical Free Church, I'm going to be a guest speaker at West Shore Evangelical Free Church. Last time I was there, I got lost. <laughs> um, I'm hoping I don't get lost. Um, but I love our brothers and sisters at West Shore Evangelical Free Church. But, but, but that dynamic of a guest speaker and thinking about this passage and the words that Jesus said, I'm aware of how awkward this sermon, or, or maybe we would liken it more to a Sunday school discussion, must have been for almost everyone. Jesus, however, is often full of hard sayings. There's a whole book titled, The Hard Sayings of Jesus, written by a faithful, gifted scholar. We often say we want to hear from him. We'll pray that way, and I do want and pray that way, to hear from Jesus. But we should also acknowledge he's not a comfortable guest preacher. We see that over and over again in Scripture. There are two kinds of hard sayings, though. There are sayings of Jesus that are hard to understand. What does this mean? And there are hard sayings of Jesus that are offensive in the way that they cut against our pride and they insult our autonomy. Eat my flesh and drink my blood might be both hard to understand and when it's understood, offensive. What does it mean? What does it mean? 
When you look at that statement in context, Jesus is using eating and drinking language as a provocative metaphor, and it is, a provocative metaphor for saving faith. He's saying that people must come to him so desperately and hungrily and thirstily, that's a word, and that we must find our soul satisfaction so much in him, it's like we're saying we feed on him and drink of him for our very life. This is not the only place Jesus speaks of saving genuine faith in provocative language. Take, for example, our beloved Matthew 11, when Jesus tells all who are weary, all who are heavy laden to come to him. Then what does he say? Take my yoke upon you. Jesus Well, I'll say it this way, that doesn't feel as provocative to us, or at least as as it did to the original agrarian audience, but Jesus is saying true faith is like being yoked to an oxen. That was the language of what you did to an oxen. You strapped them together in a field that they would plow together. Jesus is saying is knowing me is like that in such a way that it doesn't crush you. It doesn't burden you, doesn't weary you. Saving faith is this provocative connection to Jesus, to be yoked to him. And I'll leave that for a second, come back to our metaphor. This hard saying about eating his flesh and drinking of his blood caused them to grumble. Because even after it's understood, so it was hard to understand, but then once it's understood, it insults their autonomy. Jesus is saying true life isn't found anywhere else except through him. What hard sayings of Jesus cause you to grumble? What statements cause you to be offended, even scandalized by Jesus? Maybe it's this one here. Well, it wasn't that one, but now that you say that, you know, this one is troubling. Or maybe it's the sexual ethics of Jesus that feel to you so, shall we say, outdated. Or maybe it's the connection you perceive between Jesus and his church and politics, either too connected or not connected enough. Or maybe you grumble because of the followers of Jesus just feel too hypocritical. I got to text message this week from a friend who lives a few hours from here and and he just he can't imagine how Jesus can be real when he feels at least their followers are so bad his followers are so bad maybe it's the radical demands of Jesus about his ownership and sovereignty that cause you to grumble maybe your biggest challenge is what we might call a, a tragic providence some loss or trial, some unmet deep desire. Each of these, all of these, and others might cause us to take offense at Jesus. How will we respond? As things typically go, last week's passage leads to this week's passage, which is a passage all about response. How do people respond? First we read of the crowd of disciples, then Jesus, and then Peter. Let's talk about each briefly. Sometimes when people do something wild and provocative on social media, you'll see someone comment and then, and then put the gif, uh, the, or gif, the gif, someone eating popcorn, and they're like, I'm just here for the comment. Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm here to watch. I'd like to have had a bag of popcorn <laughs> and watch this guest preacher in this crowd. They don't like what he has to say, so they leave. I'll read verse 60 again, and then skip down to 66. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this, all the things I was saying a moment ago, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus says more. Then we read verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back 
and no longer walked with him. That phrasing, and, and let your eyes stay there on 66, is so interesting. They were his disciples who were not his disciples. By definition, a disciple is someone who walks in the way of another. Here, I'll read it again. After this, many of, literally says, his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Some of us know outside pressure to turn back from Jesus, from work, school, friends, family. Others feel pressure from within themselves to turn back. In your thinking about Christianity, about the church, you must have a category for disciples who are not disciples. The Bible does. I don't mean that you should strive to be a disciple who's not a disciple. Disciples who ultimately are not disciples ultimately don't go to heaven but hell. So, so have a category for that reality, but don't be in that category if you understand me. How does Jesus respond to this crowd? These disciples who, it seems at least at the time, are not disciples. At this point anyway, he seems to let them go. Verse 66 and 67. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with them. him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? I will say, though, Jesus doesn't just let them go. I say that because this is not the only ministry moment he has planned. At this point in the gospel, we're a year away from the end of the gospel, not in our preaching of it, but in the flow of the gospel of John. This is not all he has planned, but in this moment, he seems to let them leave. But he certainly doesn't let the disciples just go. Think back with me to where I began about that locker room scene. It makes a difference. It makes a great difference when the coach says, if you don't like this, you can leave, whether you know the coach wants you to stay or not. And what I want to tell you is the, the, the wording here, the, the, the minutia of the word, the wording of I'll say it through the Greek, implies Jesus expects them to stay, indeed that he wants them to stay. Now, we might call this reverse psychology or something. That might be unhelpful in ways to bring that up, but it's, it's that's sort of what's going on. You don't, you don't want to leave too. Jesus is not saying to the 12, and don't let the door hit you on the way out, so much as he's saying, I know. I know you just witnessed something hard. And I know deep down, you don't want to leave. Yet he asks it as a question to draw out a response. I believe if you're struggling, that's how Jesus is speaking to you this morning. He's telling you, I know, I know, I know you're wrestling with something hard. I want you to stay. What do you want to do? Well, how do the 12 respond to Jesus? We know through the words of Peter. Quote, Simon Peter answered him, verse 68, 69. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I love Peter's question in verse 68 because it feels so honest, doesn't it? You see it there, church? You can be honest with Jesus. You can be brutally honest with Jesus about all your doubts, all your fears, all your worries, all the ways you're, shall we say, troubled by him. You can do that if you commit by faith to Jesus as your Lord. Like you lock in the big thing. I'll show you what I mean. 
Peter says, to whom shall we go? It implies, I've looked around. <laughs> like, right there to Jesus, I, I don't know where else to go. Like, I'm looking around, I'm trying, but I don't have anywhere else to go. So, I mean, that's, that's like, if your spouse is like, well, I don't have anywhere else to go. Like, that's not very, that, all that, that's pretty honest. Peter says, it's kind of awkward to be your disciple sometimes, Jesus. But where else can I find eternal life? Yet, yet, for all his honesty, you can see in Peter a willingness to do what the crowd was unwilling to do. What does he call Jesus? Go ahead, eyes down, let's look. Like what, what, is, he, what is the first word? Lord. In that short phrase, coupled with the statement about finding life in Jesus, Peter says with his heart, I'll feed on you, I'll drink of you, and I'll be linked to you by faith no matter what. But that's not actually what he says. He doesn't say I. He says we. I love the role he played among the disciples. This is a moment, humanly speaking, it could have gone either way. And we can make fun of loud and boisterous Peter who always has got to be the first one to speak up. But do you see the way his leadership would have emboldened the other disciples in this moment? Sure, every, everyone, everyone has to make their own decision about Jesus. Jesus but it sure helps to have someone lead you. You can do this for others. You may need to be a Peter for others. You may need to be the one who looks at your friend or coworker and says, yeah, I have those same struggles too, but where else are we gonna find such forgiveness? Where will we find such a kind and strong Savior? Where else will we find life except in the living Jesus? As we close, I I, want to draw your attention to just one more place. Verse 61, 62. I didn't reread these yet, but let me do that now. They're grumbling, and, and, and Jesus says this. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? What then if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? That line about ascending to where he was before says a lot about who he is. If he was in heaven with the Father before, and he comes down, that's the whole language of John 6, I've come down as the bread came down in the wilderness, and manna, I've come down, and he's going to go back up. What does that say? He's no mere man. How will this man give us his flesh to eat, they say? He's no mere man. But I'll ask, how will Jesus get to heaven? Through the cross. Through the cross. Jesus was going to give up his life for the sake of others. And that, a Messiah who dies, a king who dies, was an even greater stumbling block to the proud who wanted a hero leader, not a suffering one. Remember 615, they were going to come make him king by force, so you'll be the king we want, king, do the thing we want you to do. We don't need you. We, we need you for that. But, but, if they could have been humble enough to see it, if we can be humble enough to see it and to taste it, we can have Jesus as both. For those who know their sin, the cross is not a stumbling block, it's not a scandal, it's precious. And then there's the empty tomb. Then there's the ascension to the throne of the universe from where he will come again. 
So let us taste and see that he is good. Let us respond to Christ. As one other author in the New Testament put it, not as those, quote, who shrink back and are destroyed, but as those who have faith and preserve their souls. I invite the music team to come forward and lead us in a time of response through singing. Would you pray with me? Lord, I can quickly rattle off in a quick paragraph in a sermon a list of potential struggles. Just acknowledge they probably don't feel like a quick list of struggles to this crowd of disciples here who might be feeling one or several of them acutely. Lord, would you draw especially near? Would you lift our eyes to see what you're doing fully in this gospel story we profess and proclaim and saving a people for yourself and building a church for your glory and our good. In Christ's name we pray.